Alleluia, Christ is risen. Be seated. A quarter of a century ago or so, I was a parish priest in western Massachusetts, right across the river from the city of Springfield. And one day I received an invitation and request to pay a visit to the confirmation class of a sizable group of eighth graders in a large synagogue in the city. My task was to take an hour with them and explain to them everything there is to know about pro Protestant Christianity. I was happy to help, so on the appointed evening I went over with my Bible and my Book of Common Prayer under my arm and an eager, if somewhat hapless, expression on my face. The task was actually impossible, given the vastness of the subject and the short 60 minutes I was provided in which to teach it, and also that my classroom was a bunch of teenagers who might or might not pay any attention to me anyway. But I was game, so I launched in. I have no idea what I said. But the kids weren't really paying much attention anyway, so I guess we all came out even. But when the class was finished and the kids were leaving, one young girl sitting toward the front asked me if the book I had brought with me was my prayer book. And I said it was. Then she told me that she really likes prayer books and asked if she could look at mine. And after flipping through it and stopping from time to time to read a passage or two, she looked up at me and said, Do you really believe that Jesus was the Son of God? And I said that I did. And she cocked one eyebrow and gave me a thoroughly incredulous and withering expression. So I added, You may not understand this now, but if you keep asking these questions, I think one day you will. There are ideas and convictions that will require of you everything you have. They are very important, but they are not easy, and they don't present themselves simplistically. You believe them because you choose to believe them. You believe them because you decide to. That answer had not been thought out beforehand. It was very much a creation of the moment. and was just what I was able to think of on the spot to try to make some kind of meaningful response to the girl who asked the question. But I've thought about those words over and over in the decades since. And it seemed to me that even if that answer didn't make any difference for the girl, and wherever that burst of wisdom came from, it was very helpful to me and I began to think about my faith, not as simply received, but as something which I was helping to create. I was working this all out for myself and understanding that believing or not believing was a choice I was given to make and that my God expected me to come to him in heart and spirit, but also in intellect and reason. But above all, God wanted me to come to him in freedom. And the idea that belief was a choice, which was mine to make, made living with my constant and nagging doubts and my never-ending hard-fought struggle to believe a lot easier. And by the way, that God wrestling, that struggle to believe, doesn't become easier just because they make you a bishop. About 10 years before my student teaching event, in the summer of 1989, Margaret and I and our girls made a visit to some of our very best friends in the world. Judd had been a seminary classmate of mine, and he and Sandy had three kids who were more or less the same age as our kids, and they'd all been raised together. And we had formed a good and close family friendship, which was strong then and endures to this day. I was a priest at that time in the Diocese of Chicago, 
and Judd was a priest in Vermont. And one day while we were visiting, he took me out to visit a church in Vermont called Mission Farm. It is a beautiful rural chapel, the Church of Our Savior, and it sits in a working farm owned by the Diocese of New York. When we were walking on the farm, he began to tell me about some of the clergy he knew had been, who had become deeply invested in the life of that farm and its mission. And he told me about a friend of his who was an Episcopal minister in Vermont, but was not ordained. His name was Garrett Kaiser, and he was a writer and a high school English teacher, and he was the lay vicar of a church in that part of Vermont they call the Northeast Kingdom. Kaiser was a very interesting person and a thinker and writer of singular ability, and has become a frequent essayist and contributor to Harper's Magazine. And walking on the farm made Judd want to talk about him. And I never forgot that conversation. So a couple of years later, Garrett Kaiser published a book about the very complicated, difficult period of discernment that he spent trying to figure out whether or not he was supposed to be ordained a priest in the church. And the year after that book was published, the Bishop of Vermont did ordain him. And a couple of years after that, I discovered a copy of his book in a used bookstore, and I bought it. The book is called A Dresser of Sycamore Trees and tells of his own rich and painful struggle over years to figure out what God wanted for him and wanted of him. And he took the title of the book from the story of the prophet Amos, who was told by the king of Israel to go be a prophet somewhere else or whatever, but anyway, to go away and leave him alone. And Amos responded, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son. I'm a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. That was Amos's discernment. And I might add that if you are wrestling with God or the devil or the voices in your own head, you should find this book. It will help. Over the years that I've served as a bishop, I've spent a fair amount of time with people who are in exactly that same discernment, struggling with the choice. And often they will find a figure from Scripture who stands for them, whose own story written in the book resonates so deeply with their own story and their life and their own struggle. A figure from Scripture whose journey in God can help to give shape and texture to one's own. For Kaiser, that figure was first Nicodemus, who came by night and unloaded all of his doubts and fears and lack of understanding onto Jesus. And that is maybe a predictable choice. But secondly, and even more so, the figure that inspired Kaiser, or that resonated for him, was the Gerasene demoniac. And there is nothing predictable about that is elegant and troubling. You will remember that Jesus encountered this man, possessed by many evil spirits, tormented and tortured and living among the tombs in the region of the Gerasenes opposite Galilee. When Jesus set his mind to help this man and cast the demons out of him, he asked him his name. And the man said, we are legion because there were so many demons inside him and they just wouldn't shut up. Kaiser spent a long time sorting out his life and his choices and his religious vocation. And through all that, he had so many voices in his head arguing with him, challenging him, guiding and misguiding him, and shouting him down, that the Gerasene demoniac who had to live with his own head full of yammering spirits and the relentless clanging of voices became the figure who stood for Kaiser in his own complicated and troubling journey with God. 
I find that image arresting because I have never heard anyone else speak of the struggle with God in such shocking language or to personally identify with the demoniac of all people. But this is what life really does look like in the land of unlikeness. Hymn 463 in our hymnal was written by the poet W.H. Auden, who in an illustrious literary career was also a contributor to the revision of our prayer book. The hymn has three short verses set on the theme of Christ as the way, the truth, and the life from the 14th chapter of the Gospel according to John. I had that hymn sung here at my consecration as bishop, but otherwise I am sure I have never sung it in church. The words are beautiful but poetically strange, and there are hundreds of other safer choices for choir directors to choose from. The first verse of the hymn reads, He is the way. Follow him through the land of unlikeness. You will see rare beasts and have unique adventures. It's different. When you hire a poet, you expect to get poetry. When you engage a wordsmith, you know you are going to get interesting words. But actually, Auden borrowed this image from St. Augustine in the seventh book of his Confessions. There, Augustine describes the many years of his life before he fully embraced the Christian faith. Years in which he struggled with the call to be a Christian, yearned for it, but also fought against it. I realized, Augustine wrote, speaking to God, I was far away from thee in a land of unlikeness. It's still an enigmatic phrase, but what is it that we are unlike in the land of unlikeness? We are unlike Christ. In the land of unlikeness, we are still in our long, long process of becoming, the struggling, the wrestling. Later on, the monastic scribes, in their own commentaries on Augustine, likened Augustine's land of unlikeness to the far country to which the prodigal son had fled to fritter away his inheritance. When I have read of Garrett Kaiser's difficult, torturous discernment, his long process of becoming, what it cost him, what it meant to him, I have thought of the land of unlikeness. And with all respect to those commentators, I don't see the land of unlikeness as a realm of immortality, but of loneliness. In my mind, I see the seeker, the discerner, the wrestler with God out alone on the wilderness road, eyes studying the horizon, yearning for God, but even more, yearning for truth and always yearning for home. And maybe Auden had some of the same thought, a wilderness place, the realm of rare beasts, a place where unique adventures may happen, a place of hope mingled with regret and fear, moving toward God, but at one's own pace, by one's own map and being lost a lot of the time. But that journey with the struggle, with the doubts, with the suffering, the long road deeply matters. And when one comes to faith, the journey to get there matters all the more. I'm telling you these things because on a day which calls us to belief, by the telling of a story that challenged everything that we know to be true, 
and every strain of reason. A story of one and only one who rose from the dead. A story of resurrection and empty tomb. A story which marries our deepest and most fervent hopes with our most difficult struggle to believe. On such a day and with such a story, I want to honor the long journey we make to get there. I want to honor the land of unkind, un, un, um, likeness, the difficulty of it and the wrestling. St. Augustine beget the poet W.H. Auden, and Auden beget Garrett Kaiser. These men spent many years of their lives following after Christ through the land of unlikeness, in peril and confusion and risk. I have two, and I think many of you have as well. But if I have a point in telling these stories, it is this. I am absolutely certain that Peter and the beloved disciple and Mary Magdalene were eminently familiar with the land of unlikeness. I'm quite convinced of the years of struggle that they made in order to get to the empty tomb. The wilderness was no stranger to them, nor was the struggle to believe. They too had lived long in the land of unlikeness. At the beginning of this gospel, Andrew and another disciple began following Jesus on the road until he turned to them and asked them what they were looking for. And they said, where are you staying? And Jesus said, come and see. That's how it started. And the disciples followed Jesus and stayed with him and ate and drank with him. And over the period of Christ's earthly mission, we watched as the disciples and the women struggled with their own faith took a step out in belief and then drew back, took a chance on Jesus and then retreated. Right to the very end, Thomas doubts, Peter denies, Judas betrays after everything they have seen and heard. Even after Jesus was raised and they saw him with their own eyes, we read that the disciples disbelieved and that when they saw Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Of course they did. The disciples loved Jesus, of that there is no doubt. But more important for them than having a friend was that they needed a savior. Jesus was their companion, but more than that, he was the Lord. He was the hope of the world for them. And these poor and powerless people had believed Jesus and cast their lives and their hopes and yearnings and needs upon him. And Jesus' mission was personal for them, and the stakes were high. They believed in Jesus because they chose to. Peter and John and Mary Magdalene were not blind followers of Christ. They were people with real lives and fears that kept them awake at two in the morning and hopes for their children, and fears about life and death, and about illness and poverty, about political oppression, war and enemies. And they were people who had done things, and some of those things covered them over with regret and shame and guilt. Jesus came among them, and he told them that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. He told them that God loves the poor, he told them that their sins were forgiven, and he talked to them about everlasting life. When they decided to put their trust in Jesus, when they made the decision to follow him, and when they took a chance and believed in the things he said and the things he did, there was a lot riding on that. They deserve our respect and compassion because their story is our story. But by the time we get to the 20th chapter of John on Easter morning and follow these disciples to the tomb, 
By every appearance, Jesus' mission has failed. Over the previous week, they had seen him fall into the hands of sinners, and step by step, his freedom and his dignity and his followers and finally his life were all stripped from him. The disciples we see on Easter morning are broken and betrayed. And the unique adventure they had made in following Jesus and believing in him had failed. So when we see Mary Magdalene arrive at Jesus' tomb, or Peter and the beloved disciple race to the grave, understand that this is not a story of simple grief. It is a story about the end of the world. But Jesus was raised in this story, whatever one would make of that. And each of them responded to what they saw in their own way, as seeking, discerning, hoping, and needful people, struggling, wrestling people. Peter ran into the tomb and saw, but gave no opinion. The beloved disciple ran into the tomb and saw and believed, and they went away to their homes. But Mary stayed and waited in the garden and let her grief and her hopelessness and her fear wash over her until Jesus appeared and called her by name. And for Mary, being called by name was the recognition by God that awakened her again. Mary followed Jesus through the land of unlikeness in all of her discernment and all of her questions, all the way from Magdala to the empty tomb. And on the other side of the tomb, she found pure joy, a heart lifted before God, a new hope, a new life and a new world. Another great Anglican poet wrote these words. When such as I cast out remorse, so great a sweetness flows into the breast. We must laugh and we must sing. We are blessed by everything. Everything we look upon is blessed. Dear friends, Alleluia, Christ is risen. Amen. Amen.